America's new race into space with spin launch. The problem with getting things into orbit has always been the rocket equation. That is, the vast majority of what it takes to get a rocket beyond our atmosphere is fuel, more than 90% of it. But what if, in fact, most of that fuel is not actually needed? I think it's gonna be 105 today. Welcome to the high desert of New Mexico. In a remote valley of New Mexico, beyond gates that look like they're straight out of a science fiction movie, an object that seems like alien technology towers above the terrain. 2.2 million tons of steel and a little bit taller than the Statue of Liberty. That's right. This is A33, short for Accelerator 33. And it's the world's largest diameter vacuum chamber. So it's the brainchild of Jonathan Yaney, founder and CEO of Spin Launch. So we're standing here underneath the vacuum chamber. This is the main launch vehicle loading door. Okay. One of the really interesting features about this particular system is that it's on hydraulics and the entire system can rotate. Yaney's company has been at it since 2014, but most of the construction on this project took place during the COVID years. It's an idea designed for a new space age that relies on a concept that dates back to the Stone Age, the sling. This is essentially a sling launch system, which you know we were using to hunt with 50,000 years ago. It's, it's simply using modern materials uh, and encased in, in a large vacuum chamber. So what you have is you have an arm that you know, slowly rotates around and around, driven by an electric motor. And once the tip velocity is sufficient for uh, it to be able to carry a spacecraft into space, we simply let go. And it travels outside of the vacuum chamber through the atmosphere in about 30 seconds into space. The sling in this case is a carbon fiber tether, which spins the launch vehicle or projectile until it hits 5,000 miles an hour sending it through an airtight membrane hurtling towards space and eliminating the need to lift all that fuel used in traditional rockets. Launching in three, two, one. All new forms of transportation usually seem kind of crazy. Whether it's a suspension bridge, a train, an aeroplane, you know, even the automobile. And we arrive at these new innovative methods through the process of experimentation. To reach the necessary speed, the tether has to operate in a vacuum. Over here, you have a bank of low vacuum mechanical pumps, which extract the sort of first amount of air. And then you have the very, very large high vacuum pump which uses an entirely different type of non-mechanical process to extract the remaining molecules of air out of the chamber, allowing you to achieve high vacuum, which allows us to go hypersonic speeds here at sea level. So you have zero air in there when it's launched? About one one thousandth of atmosphere, correct. Yaney was inspired in part by a 1960s U.S. military program that tried using very large guns to send projectiles into space. The program was eventually abandoned. But Yaney's been obsessed with all things aeronautic since he was a kid, including flying. I was sitting on my mom's lap when I was like three years old, holding the controls, like learning how to fly. So I've kind of been flying the Cessnas my whole life. On some level, you, you know, flying in the sky, you look up to space, you, know, you say, well, what else is there? And I think it always bugged me that we went to the moon you know, but then we, we like stopped. We just sort of never went back. It's like we're, you know, as, as a civilization, we were promised that we were gonna have, you know, we're gonna have all of this expansion to space and that just, it just proved to be astronomically expensive. I would love it if we could just give them some wind. Maybe, I mean, you can knock them over, that's fine too, if you want to. <laughs> Welcome to the belly of the beast. Nice. Yaney took us inside the launcher. From here we climbed to see the motor that provides the circulating force, or torque. So this entire shaft is spinning into the vacuum chamber, and there's a seal around it which prevents the air, the passage of air around it. So it's a relatively straightforward industrial system that combine. <laughs> relatively <laughs> straightforward. To create something truly, truly unique. Team Jonathan here, go ahead and begin the test rotation now. 
How fast is this shaft spinning? Yeah, this shaft will spin at about 1200 RPM here in this test facility. So again, fast, but quite a bit slower than your automobile, for example. Huh. Which brings us back to the projectiles which will eventually be used to transport satellites and much needed equipment into space. You want it to be heavy in the front and then you want it to be light in the back so that it is, it is essentially passively stabilized. It's like a dart. And so you just simply throw it out at a velocity and it self guides its way on its own trajectory. These are some of the projectiles they've been using. A third the size of the one they hope will eventually travel nearly 40 miles above the earth where a gas engine will engage and help complete its journey into orbit. This is all about really retiring the risk around the core technology. So I liken it to our Wright brothers moment, you know, when they flew the, the very first aircraft. They were you know, able to fly a few thousand feet or you know, then a few, a few miles. They certainly weren't carrying passengers across the Atlantic, but it was a very, very pivotal moment because you proved that the technology could work. And from there, you then scale and expand. An added advantage? This transportation device is completely reusable, making the launch system a heck of a lot easier on the planet. It represents really the electrification of the space transportation industry. You know, we're seeing so many of these transportation industries becoming electrified right now, yet rockets in their inherent nature rely upon simply pushing massive amounts of combusted products out the back of the rocket. It's really the only way historically to get to space. So you have to employ a system like Spin Launch if you want to reduce the carbon footprint of space access, which is incredibly important. With every phase, the centrifuge has gotten bigger. After 10 successful launches here in New Mexico, Spin Launch is already looking at what's next. A centrifuge three times as large as A33. The spin launch final phase. Location to be determined. And when do you think spin launch is going to actually be putting things into orbit? We're going to see spin launch putting things in orbit, certainly uh, in, in the next five years. Is that a promise? <laughs> Hold me to it. <laughs> it's hard to imagine a centrifuge being three times as large as the one that they have now, since it's already as tall as the Statue yeah. of Liberty. They spent $150 million so far to put together what they have. They're talking about another $250 million they would need wow. if they're going to build this even bigger one that would then finish the project. That sounds astronomically expensive, but it's probably a lot less than the old-fashioned way. And part of it's a lot less, yeah, because of the way they're doing it, and also because you're not sending humans in. Yes. I mean, this is sending equipment and right. satellites. Right. Humans can't withstand tens of thousands of Gs. Yeah. Pressure, yeah. But it well, is a you new idea. Very cool. Jeff. You could have. Could try. <laughs> but Maverick and he did like he pulled like ten, 10. Gs yep. in, yeah, in Top good. Gun Maverick. Could do well, that. 